Good morning, Jane. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing very good. It's thank you so much for taking the time to join this sentientist conversation. Um, it's looking forward to it. Yeah. So as we've talked about briefly before, this is a series of conversations about what I think of as the two most important philosophical questions. What's real? Uh, how should we choose what to believe and what to understand about the universe, as imperf imperfectly as that is, but also what matters morally? What should we have compassion for? Uh, what should we care about and why? And for uh, most of my guests, it's really a story of where they started out as a kid and how that those views on what's real and what matters have shifted over time, if they have. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the back end talking about the future and whether that makes us feel optimistic or otherwise. But before we get into those two deep questions, it would be fascinating for people who don't know you already, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and your work. My name is Jane Velez Mitchell. I'm a journalist and author. I've written four books and two New York Times bestsellers. I was on TV for many years uh, here in the United States, most recently on CNN Headline News. Prior to that, I was a local news anchor in Los Angeles, New York. I also worked in Philadelphia and Minneapolis and Fort Myers, Florida. Prior to that, I was at NYU where I graduated. I was born and raised in Midtown Manhattan. And I run a nonprofit after many years in mainstream media. I switched my attention when I got to the age of retirement to a nonprofit. So I work just as hard, but it's for a cause. And the cause is to wake people up to the self-sabotage of eating animals and how we can transition to a plant-based world and in the process solve most of the health problems that plague humanity from heart disease to cancer and human world hunger because animals are eating most of the food, reverse climate change, stop habitat destruction, wildlife extinction. The list is long. Yeah. Water pollution, dietary racism, environmental racism. There are so many things that would just melt away if we stopped eating animals. Jane Unchained is a social media news network based on janeunchained.com, but we have many tentacles everywhere. We do a daily vegan cooking show called Lunch Break Live on our Facebook page, which is my name, because what happened was when I left uh, CNN Headline News, HLN, I left on great terms. I had a nice run, six years of a show, and I said, can I have my social media? So I have the check mark. So it's facebook.com slash Jane Velez Mitchell. But we do tons. It's like a news feed of not only cooking, vegan cooking demos, but demonstrations. Now during COVID, we have given all our top contributors their own shows via StreamYard. So they interview people. But every single day without fail, since Facebook Live came around, we do a daily vegan cooking show called Lunch Break Live at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 Eastern. I don't no, off the top of my head, what that is London time is probably late supper, but it's great. We've never repeated a recipe, not by intention, but just because everybody makes their recipes a little bit different. And that just shows the versatility of vegan cooking. And then out of that, we developed a TV show that is on Amazon's Prime Video called New Day, New Chef. And you can watch it in England. It's on the United States, it's in England, it's in Ireland, it's in Australia, it's in New Zealand, and it's in Canada. So it's pretty much in most of the English speaking world. And that is a studio, <coughs> excuse me, that is a studio production. It's, we shot it at a sound stage near Hollywood. Eamon McChrystal, who's a wonderful former Irish tenor, uh, multi Emmy winning producer has produced it. We're about to shoot another one. Our first season we did prior to COVID. The second season we did during COVID and we focused on the work of Maggie Baird, who is Billie Eilish's mother. And she's doing something called support and feed where she gets people to donate. They, she gives the money to vegan restaurants. The vegan restaurants make the food and then support and feed picks it up and delivers it to people who are hungry because we need to feed hungry people and first responders nutritious food, not pastrami sandwiches. That's what we've been doing. One final thing, there's many other things, but it seems like every day, now I'm dealing with Clubhouse, which is a whole other thing. It's <laughs> yeah. like, please, I gotta sleep. But we <laughs> also channel. did a, a documentary, which I like to put up called Countdown to Year Zero. And this is on Amazon's Prime Video. Countdown to Year Zero prof profiles the work of Dr. Silas Rao, 
who has made a commitment to create a vegan world by 2026. Now, I think it's very important as a journalist to create a deadline. We all know until we say we're going to, until there's a deadline, I don't care whether it's your taxes or whatever, you probably don't get started. So he is a systems analyst, PhD engineer from Stanford, who was very instrumental in the acceleration of internet speeds, super brilliant man. I'd call him a genius, but you can decide. And he has said, we're going to create a vegan world. We know why we have to do it. We know when we have to do it by 2026. That's the point where we will have destroyed all wildlife vertebrates, essentially, in this world. That's the, We're on the trajectory to destroy pretty much all wildlife. And I'm talking with the exception of squirrels and other animals that are adept at surviving in cities, et cetera. But the owls, the penguins, the we're right here in uh, California. They're trying to destroy the last coastal wetlands in L.A. And we're fighting it. I don't live far from it. He has basically said, we're going to use the same system that we use to create the internet, which is just a system of creating a whole bunch of questions, breaking those questions down into committees and task force groups and studying what we need to do to create a vegan world by 2026. So if you want to get involved, he's written a white paper that shows that animal agriculture is responsible for 87% of greenhouse gas emissions, not the 14 or the 18 or the 51% that you've heard. That's at climatehealers.org. He is willing to debate anyone, so far no takers, but he makes a very powerful argument that the numbers have been twisted and that I could go into more detail. Yeah, well, but that's fascinating. Argument. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. And you've given us a pretty strong steer as to your (laughs) philosophy and your priorities already. And it would be great in this conversation to understand your journey of how you got there. And in in the conversation, the reason they're called sentientist conversations is in the context of I'm trying to promote this very simple philosophy, a really broad worldview called sentientism, which just says that uh, when it comes to what's real, we should take a naturalistic approach, a scientific approach to prudently, provisionally, and probabilistically understanding reality. And when it comes to what matters, the clue is in the name, we should focus on sentience and have compassion for any being that has the capacity to experience suffering and flourishing. But in these conversations, I'm talking to people who disagree and agree. So it'll be very interesting. I have some suspicions already as to areas where we'll agree, but it'll be fascinating to to know your personal story. So the first of those questions is what's real? How do we understand the universe? And almost what do we think the universe is ultimately? It's quite a deep question. But Many people answer that by explaining whether they grew up in a religious or a spiritual household or a naturalistic or an atheistic household and how their beliefs on that sort of side of philosophy have shifted over time if they have. So it would be great to know your story on that side of philosophy. Well, what's real? I don't know. <laughs> That's probably the best answer I've had so far. I was just listening to this book because I do walk every day when I come out of my isolation zone. I'm very lucky to live at the beach. So I walk on the beach and I listen to Audible. And I'm listen- I just li- finished listening to this book called Life After Life, People Who've Had Near-Death Experiences. Mm. And it's very interesting. Uh, and it was a doctor who didn't believe in any of it, who's put it together and said, only in recent times have we had the technological ability to resuscitate people from, we don't know whether it's death or clinical death or what you're normally in, in prior ages, they would die. Yeah, and yeah. now with, with all the technology, And a lot of those people supposedly report, I just finished listening to this book, experiences where they go above their body, they can hear what people are saying, they go through a tunnel, they're greeted by a a light, a warm light, and then they have to decide, are they going to stay, are they going to go? And they're asked, you know, what basically, not with a judgment, but they're asked, is almost like you get the impression that if it, it, and what he said is he started out as a skeptic, and then these stories were so eerily similar that he just said, let me investigate this and collect them. And uh, basically, it's what have you done in your life? Not in a judgmental way, but just asking what, what was, what, it's not like judgment day, but it was just, what have you done with your life? Yeah, like and, a retrospective. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, they also talk about seeing the movie really quickly of your whole life event. Now, I have no clue whether any of that is real, but it is thought provoking, right? Yeah. I mean, at the very least, it's fascinating about how our minds work and the experiences it can generate, whether or not you think it means there's something 
external. That's interesting food for thought. And did you grow up in a religious context or a... I grew up in Midtown Manhattan, right across from Carnegie Hall. My mom is from Puerto Rico, from the island of Vieques. My dad was Irish American. He was an advertising executive who had an agency on Madison Avenue, right out of Mad Men. My mother was the last of the vaudevilles. She was a theatrical performer. She had a dance group called Anita Velez Dancers, and she performed at uh, clubs all around uh, uh, Caribbean, the United States, and some Canada. And uh, they were very glamorous yeah. uh, people, very show busy. My mother was very ahead of her time. She was uh, the one who had given up meat as a young child because when she was on the island, she had a pig that she thought was her friend, but it was a food pig. And when the animal was slaughtered, she fainted. And so she shunned meat from that point on. And then when she met my father, he also pretty much shunned meat. I wouldn't say he never grabbed something on Thanksgiving on a table, but yeah. we didn't have meat in our house. That's pretty we early. We did unfortunately have fish, but luckily my mother didn't cook. She was a performer. Like she was, she could, but between my father and my mother, they, my father could make curry and my mother could make like spaghetti and clam sauce. And that was it. I, I, we actually thought we were vegetarian, but we were pescatarian. Yeah. And then yeah. as I grew up, but my, but getting back to my mom was very ahead of her time. She was one of the first hyphenates. So instead of calling herself Anita Mitchell, she kept her, her original, her name, Anita yeah. Velez Mitchell. And she was an early hyphen. She was doing yoga in the, 40s when nobody knew what yoga was yeah. and uh, she talked about transcendentalism and past lives she dabbled in all of that yeah i always yeah. said that we would go to different churches as an adventure but when somebody got really sick and they were on their deathbed we went to the catholic church and lit a candle <laughs> catholicism is yeah. there embedded yeah with puerto and, uh, rico and the irish ancestry you've exactly. got a strong default there right Exactly. I think that it was a very interesting upbringing. I remember we went to the Universalist Church sometimes. My dad, they were into macrobiotics for a while. So they were, they yeah, dabbled yeah. in different things. And there was no strong religious anything. It was just more dabbling, I would yeah. call it. Yeah, it's an interesting way of describing it. And, and it, it sounds like you followed that path as well. This is interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. But none of these things were a sort of dominant force in your life that guided the way you think it was just open-minded and experimentation and yeah is that exactly. a fair way of summarizing it yeah look i think we all know what's right and what's wrong let mm. your conscience be your guide in the words of jiminy cricket it's not that yeah. complicated <laughs> wise words wise words yeah <laughs> right yeah. killing and, animals and think... for a habit that's <laughs> unnecessary bad for us bad for the planet torture for the animals is wrong and this brings it's us on to simple. and this brings us on to the second question, right? What's what matters morally and why do things matter morally? And in these conversations, it's been fascinating because there are many people who are very seriously religious, and that's where they get their ethics from, right? Their ethics is really defined by there's a deity that is the instantiation of good and bad, and there's a list of rules in a religious book or whatever it is, right? Or things the priests tell you, or the imams tell you, that's that defines good or bad. And some people are nervous about moving away from a religious worldview because they're worried that they won't have any foundation for their morality. What will good or bad even mean anything anymore? But other people take a different route, which is almost relativistic, where they say, okay, there is no externally defined morality, right? Because maybe there's no God or there's no authority. And they take a approach which says, well, anything goes, right? As long as a group negotiates it, then that's up to them. And there's no intrinsic good or bad. I don't think you or I have that approach at all because there's another approach which is there are just certain things which are defined in my own mind by my own conscious as wrong or right and i don't feel the need for any external authority to tell me that so but if i was to ask you what what does matter morally and what are good and bad morally to you how would you answer that and has that shifted over the course of your life as well as you've thought more about I think we all know, we just consult our heart and there is a mechanism in our bodies that tells us when we're doing something wrong. Mm. And it's guilt, shame, remorse. And I'm a recovering alcoholic, I'll be knock on wood 26 years sober by April 1st. And that's a good anniversary because I made fools, fooled myself at parties. And- Congratulations for the 26th. Thank you. And 
I do pray every morning. I never did that before I got sober, but mm. once I got sober, the advice was just get on your knees and pray in the morning and turn it over and seek guidance and, and don't ask for things, but just, it centers me, it grounds me, it helps me start the day out on the spiritual beam. I fall off all the time, but it helps me get grounded. I also make my bed every morning. That's another one of those little sobriety tricks. Yeah, you know, get discipline organized. and routine. Yeah, and so I find that helps. I don't know who I'm turning it over to, and I don't think we have to have a definition of a higher power, except that it's not me. Yeah. I think when things go south morally is when we are the center of the universe. Everything revolves around us. It's all about us, ego. Yeah. And throughout time, people have always craved the same things, power, money, prestige. There's, I'm sure, a sexual component to that as yeah. well. Yeah. And so when we're motivated just by that, as someone said, great ambition unchecked by morality is a very dangerous thing. So I think that we all know what the right thing to do is. There are forces in our society that are motivated by greed that tell us, no, that suffering doesn't mm. count. You don't have to worry about that suffering. And if you have to basically summarize the basis of all evil, I believe it's that some suffering doesn't count. In, throughout the course of human history, if you want to see morally contemptible behavior, generally the commonality is that suffering doesn't count, whether yeah. it's a person or what's happening today by the billions, animals. And I walk around, and I see all these people, they call themselves animal lovers, ahimsa, they've got their dogs or do their yoga. I'm peaceful, I do all things with love, except they're eating animals. They are ordering the hit on those animals. Those animals are tortured and they're in denial. But I do believe on some level in the reptilian brain, they are aware yeah. that they are killing and it makes them uncomfortable, which is why when you try to bring up the subject, they don't wanna hear about it. Yeah. And, and I just wanna say that I don't think we're coming from up here because I think we all do that to a certain degree. If I had to think about all the components in the computer that I'm using to talk to you, I'm sure that there's some cruelty involved. And I think about that. Uh, the thing that is so apparent to me is that the cruelty we're inflicting on billions of animals is completely 100% unnecessary. In fact, it's the leading destructive force in our world. So it's complete self-sabotage. And I'll go back to the addiction metaphor one more time. When I was a drinker, I thought, this is my solution, when indeed it was my problem. We think animals, eating animals, growing animals is our solution when it's our problem. We also, I also thought, oh, it's gonna be a terrible sacrifice to give up drinking. Actually, as there's an old cliche, my worst day sober is better than my best day as a drinker. And the same thing with eating animals. My worst day as a vegan is better than my best day eating animals, wearing animals, torturing animals. So I think we all know it's just a question of breaking through the wall of denial. Yeah. That's what we really need to do. And I think the you come back to this idea of suffering as I think central to the way you think about morality and I, and I do too. And that's it, in a way the essence of this idea of sentientism, because if any being has the capacity to suffer, then, you know, that's almost the definition of sentience, right? It goes back to, and this isn't a new idea, right? This has roots that have thousands of years of history behind them all around the world. And, you know, were crystallized even hundreds of years ago by people like Jeremy Bentham saying, can they suffer? That's the central question when we're setting our moral boundary and deciding what types of beings matter. And why do we care about a pig more than a carrot or a rock or a river? It's really that capacity to suffer. So I think we share that in common. And you mentioned this challenge around a sort of human centric or anthropocentric approach that thinks that we are the be all and end all of everything. And the harms that can lead to. And it's interesting because people can get to that conclusion both through a sort of religious worldview where they say that humans are made in the image of God 
and animals are not, or animals are put here for us to have dominion over, or humans have souls and animals don't have souls. So all of that can be used to justify centering on human interests and disregarding others. But it can How also happen. How do they know about any well, of that? I agree, right. And I, and I don't think any religious moral system <laughs> is well-founded at all. So to me, that's somewhat irrelevant. But there's a risk you can do that, even from a scientific and a naturalistic point of view as well, because you can think about humans as being the tip of some evolutionary tree or the most intelligent or the most brilliant or look at all the things we've created and the dolphins haven't built any skyscrapers so we're worth more so i think there's that risk of over focusing on humans whether or not you have a religious or a naturalistic worldview but at the same time i think you can fix that through a naturalistic worldview as well because i have quite what might seem quite a hard-edged naturalistic scientific worldview i think there's just matter and dark matter and energy and dark energy and information processing and that's it right there's natural laws i don't think there's any supernatural deities or magic or mysticism but even in that way of thinking i have a deep sense of awe and wonder and interconnectedness with the whole universe and a sense that we're just a tiny insignificant part of something amazing so i think you can still get to that look you don't always have to put you or the humans in the center even if you have a completely scientific way of thinking. And that's partly the idea behind the sentientism idea is that humanism can help address many of our sort of human ethical problems around racism and sexism, caste discrimination. And humanism says, no, we are all human, have compassion for all humans. But obviously there's a challenge in the name there, right? It, and then it's again, focused too much on our species, whereas sentientism says, yes, we need to fight all of those human discriminations, but we also need to put our arms around all sentient beings too and as you say you know ultimately all types of suffering need to be need to matter we need to have compassion yeah so that's fascinating and and it sounds like both of your parents were very early in at least being aware of the ethics of non-human animals and and the link to the food that they were you know mm. choosing to consume as well and the products they were choosing to consume which is interesting because that's that's pretty early in the modern consciousness to be able to make that shift but how did you go through that journey? And at what stages did you start to get more serious about the ethical implications of non-human suffering? After I graduated from NYU and I was working first in Florida, then Minneapolis, then I got a job in Philadelphia and somebody sent me a videotape of some horrific head injury experiments. This had to be around 1980, right around the time that PETA was being founded. Yeah. Uh, head injury experiments on primates that were happening at a local university. And, and I'll never forget looking at it and just saying, this is evil. This is, they were playing rock music and joking and they were bashing these monkeys heads in and then holding up their little hands and laughing. And I thought, this is sadism and this is animal experimentation. Oh my God. And I just filed it away because I didn't know what I could do about it at the time. But that happened to be when PETA was getting started. As I then continued on my career. I worked in New York for eight years at WCBS, still wasn't able to really do anything about activism. I don't know if I felt like I was an activist. Then I went to LA and I was working at a, a local TV station as a news anchor and uh, in walks Howard Lyman to do an interview with me. He's the mad cowboy, the fourth generation cattle rancher who became very ill and made a pact with God. And he said, God, if you get me out of the surgery alive, I'll reveal the secrets of my terrible industry. And he went on Oprah. This is 20 some years ago. And she said, oh, he said some horrible things that they do to animals in, in the animal agriculture industry. And she said, that just stopped me cold from eating another burger. That was her quote and the cattleman sued her. And it was a big uh, drama at the time. I think she had to move her show to Texas for a while. Anyway, Howard Lyman, who had written a book called Mad Cowboy became famous at that time. And so we did an interview with him. And afterwards, he and his publicist walked up to my cubicle and they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. And by that time I was vegetarian and I, take, I had given up first you know, fish and then I gave up shellfish and then, but I was, I was still eating dairy. And, and they mm -hmm. said, do you eat dairy? And I hung my head because he had just told the horrible stories about the babies ripped from the mothers and, the boys put in veal crates or shot and all these terrible things. And I hung my head and I said, yes, I do eat dairy. And then both of them went like this, liquid meat right at my nose, liquid meat. So yeah. when people say 
That's the moment I went vegan. And that was, um, I wish I had my date the way I have my sobriety date, but that was, I think it was about 22, 23 years ago. It was when this was all happening with the Oprah show around yeah. that time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I always say, people say, don't confront people. Don't, he shamed me into going vegan. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, because if he had said it very like, well, you should consider maybe giving up dairy because I might not have heard it. When he put, when they put their finger in my nose and they said liquid meat, just yesterday, I don't go out that often, but I had to go out to the vet and a woman backed into my car, but she was very elderly. And I said, it's okay. And then I turned to her and I said, go vegan. And she said, I'm a vegetarian. And I said, dairy is liquid meat. So I try to do to other people what he did to me because thank God. And so that's when I, after, you know, it's very interesting. First, I wouldn't have done anything if I hadn't gotten sober. So I say, if you yeah. love animals, whatever your addiction is, whether it's food or alcohol or drugs or gambling or sex or whatever, get, take care of it and get help for it. Because if you want to be a successful act activist, I think it's important to get those things out of the way. In fact, if every vegan on the planet just stopped drinking alcohol and took that money and donated it to animal rights groups like PETA, I think we could hit the tipping point tomorrow. That makes us sound like a bunch of luscious, but no, what I mean is if every single person donated that discretionary income to animal rights causes. So once I got sober, once I went vegan, then interestingly, I started A, having the time, instead of going dancing at night, I had more time and more energy to devote to activism. And I still didn't have really a way that I thought, I started arguing in the newsroom, I'm not gonna read this story, it's not fun. A rodeo is not a fun story. Some idiot D radio DJ dropping a frozen turkey out of a helicopter is not a fun story, I won't read it. Mm. I started picking up the glue traps that they would leave around the uh, newsroom. Those were little things. Then I got to celebrity justice. After basically many years in local news, I jumped to the syndicated show called Celebrity Justice, which was a tabloid show. And the celebrities did not want to talk to us. They would run from us. This was the precursor <laughs> to TMZ. I don't know if you've heard of TMZ, but it's this big site. Anyway, every morning uh, there would be a, a meeting and the boss would say, Where's the celebrity? Where's the justice? And it was at very early in the morning. And I would be like, oh God, I've got to have a story. I've got to have a story. And then I thought, but now I've been going to these PETA galas. I'm going to work with PETA, see if I can find celebrities. Because celebrities literally would run from us. And sure enough, cele certain celebrities cared so much about their animal causes that they would push their publicists aside because they wanted to talk to us. Yeah. I even interviewed Robert Redford. He was concerned about the military sonar's impact on the whales. And he literally pushed his publicist aside who didn't want him to talk to me and said, I wanna to talk to this young lady about that. What a nice guy. So that's how I got into it. I started basically using my profession, journalism, even if it was a tabloid variety to talk about animal rights. Then when I got the show on uh, CNN Headline News, I asked them very casually, I said, I sort of got it through a fluke. Somebody had walked off the set. I had been covering the Michael Jackson trial. I had been on quite a few like Larry King Live and filling in for uh, Nancy Grace, who was a crime anchor, still is. And uh, I got the show because somebody walked off the set and they said it was a fluke. And I just said, hey, would you mind if I did an animal segment once a week? And they thought about it for a second. They said, no, we don't see a problem with that. Maybe they thought I was going to do pet adoptions. Next thing you know, I started doing hardcore animal rights activism once a week on HLN. And I want to thank them. I always say thank you for allowing me to do that because- How did it um, go down? What, what sort of reception did you get? Oh, it was great. We had all the leaders of all the different organizations on. I remember I, I interviewed Josh Tetrick when he was just starting Just Mayo. And he told me now that's a huge company and just egg and they're massive, saving a lot of animals, oh. changing things. And he said he used that clip to uh, go out and pitch his, his alternative to mayonnaise to a whole bunch of big corporations. So I know that we had an impact for six years doing an animal rights segment every Friday on a 
basically a global network. It was seen on in 39 countries. Yeah, it's going to shift the culture a bit, isn't it? Yeah. So when my show wrapped, I had a nice run, six years. I left on great terms. I've always been very appreciative of my opportunity there. I said, Would, uh, can I have my social media, which I had never touched. I had never tweeted a thing. I didn't even know the password. Thank God I probably would have gotten into trouble much more quickly because people <laughs> get in trouble on Twitter, as we all know. Oh. But they said, sure, here's your, here's all your social media. I How I ended up starting the nonprofit, my girlfriend at the time, and I also came out as gay during the whole get sober uh, phase back around that time that I got sober. Once I got sober, I, I couldn't push that down either. And so my girlfriend at the time said, uh, I said, let's go to a protest. I said, now, I said, I'm basically, I'm not associated with a news organization for the first time in my life. After 38, yeah, I, after 38 years, you can't go to a protest when you're work, a reporter. And uh, it's a fireable offense to go and participate in a protest. I said, she goes, yeah, Jane's Unchained. And I said, oh, that's cute, Jane Unchained. And that's what we created as an, I created this nonprofit and started going to protest. And I remember one of the first protests we covered was at the Staples Center, nine degrees out in Brooklyn, 200 people holding signs against Ringling Brothers. My hand was shaking with the GoPro. At the time I was using a GoPro. And I, I thought- to myself, And for the people watching and listening who are in centigrade land, that's nine degrees Fahrenheit, right? Nine degrees Fahrenheit, yeah, yeah it was cold, <laughs> cold and windy. And we were outside the Staples Center and I, I was shooting one of my first stories for Jane Unchained. Basically, my idea was I'll do what I used to do on TV. I'll do it on social media. And that's pretty much what we've done. Yeah. And then we graduated back to TV. But anyway, it was against Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. And I'll never forget. I said, is this worth it? It's so cold. I said, yeah, just do the next indicated thing and stay out of the results. And guess what? Not thanks to me, thanks to PETA and other groups, Ringlings is gone. Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus with all those horrible animals being abused is gone. So you never know what the impact of your actions are going to be. Just do it if you feel it's the right thing and don't obsess about whether it's going to be effective or not. Something will happen eventually. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating. Well, I, and I have to say that your retirement doesn't sound much like a uh, retirement at the moment. <laughs> and but I you will say a lot of people come up to me and they look really old and they go, I watched you when I was a little kid. <laughs> the secret to eternal youth. <laughs> but, but you've and you've touched on another really interesting challenge, which is that many people do say that, as you say, they love animals or they care about animals, they have compassion for them, but often it's quite selective. Most people will feel a sense of warmth and connection and compassion for their companion animals. Most people will feel that sense of at least reverence for the charismatic wild animals. But then it starts to get trickier, right? And most people will, in practical terms, exclude consideration for farmed animals and fish, as we know. But there's also a challenge even within the animal advocacy movement around wild animals too. So I'm interested in your perspective on the maybe intractable difficult subject of wild animal suffering. Do you have a perspective on whether that matters morally too? Of course, obviously I'm uh, very much opposed to hunting, but yeah. if you want to look at what's really destroying the wild animals, it's animal agriculture, creating deforestation, destroying their habitats. It's happening right now in the largest wetlands in Brazil, the Pantanal, cougars and all sorts of exotic animals are just dying because they're putting it on fire to grow cattle, to have cattle grazing land. Mm. A huge percentage, something like what? Just a huge percentage of non-ice land on this planet is used for cattle grazing. If we eliminated that alone and reforested those areas or stopped destroying those areas, we could start to reverse climate change. One of the things that people don't realize, even with the Paris Climate Accords, and this was explained to me by Dr. Rao, is that Animal, if you reforested all the land, which is most of the land between the cattle grazing land and the farmland used to grow crops to feed 80 billion animals <laughs> we kill every year, that's most of the land that is being used. And so if you stopped doing that and you reforested a good portion of that land, since trees absorb carbon, you could begin to reverse climate change. 
all the other mitigation efforts directed at fossil fuels would would potentially stop the acceleration of climate change, but it wouldn't start reversing it. And he also, I'm no scientist, but he goes into the fact that some of the fossil fuels are cooling gases. So if you just focus on that and you eliminate the cooling gases, you could actually accelerate climate change. So animal agriculture is something that we really need to address. We have big, powerful minds like Bill Gates has now said we all rich nations need to switch to synthetic meat. Yeah, that is yeah. a huge break breakthrough. He's not a vegan. He's a business leader and he's done the math and he's saying <sighs> it's not sustainable. We yeah, got yeah. to switch. It's so, so, I, it's I so think clear. It's right really now. important that we punch holes through denial. Everybody punch holes through denial. I don't care whether it's Paris Jackson just the other day teaming up with Stella McCartney um, saying in her promo for a compassionate brand and animal agriculture is making climate change worse. She has millions of followers. Everybody needs to start. We need to break through the environmental groups denial, the conservation yeah. groups denial. So this is and this is one other challenge I have with the conservation and the environmentalist movements because in a way if you come back to this question about our moral circle right should we just care about some humans ones like us should we care about all humans should we care about all sentient beings where do you draw that line in a way the environmentalist and the conservationist movement have gone even further they've said actually we should care about the environment itself we should care about trees and rocks and rivers and ecosystems and habitats and species and I don't, I don't mind that i don't think those things can suffer i don't think they can experience anything directly at all so i don't think they are mor morally significant in themselves but they're deeply important because they're so important to all the sentient beings in the wild and humans as well so i, I share that appreciation for the wider ecosystem but it seems like most environmentalists have broaden their compassion for you know the environment and the ecosystems as a whole but have conveniently ignored many trillions of sentient beings particularly the farmed ones and most of the wild ones from their moral consideration so in a way they've gone really generous with their compassion but are still withdrawing compassion and ignoring the impact of animal farming in particular it seems a really weird sort of warping that ultimately means that a lot of environmentalism is really still just about what humans want. It's not really about a genuine concern for non-human sentient beings. So I, that's not true of all environmentalists, but I find that a deep frustration. It's almost as if there's a, a taboo about challenging animal farming and fishing in the environmental movement. They just don't seem to want to talk about it. Because they're eating animals. Yeah. And, and it's very hard to condemn a system when you're habitually in society exactly. part of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It'd be like me drinking and getting drunk and saying, you should get sober. Yeah. There's a hypocrisy. And I think we're all hypocrites to a certain extent. Nobody's yeah, going. There's no perfection here, right? Thing. However, uh, I, that's why it was so great when Joaquin Phoenix got up there at the Golden Globes and the SAG Awards and the Oscars and spoke truth to power. And the two of the awards dinners were plant based. If you can have the biggest Hollywood award ceremonies plant-based, then surely the environmental galas can be plant-based and think. conservation galas can be plant-based. And I've been to conservation galas and, and events at fancy places in Beverly Hills where you see that they're serving meat. And I even went up to the head of one of the conservation groups and I'm like, you're serving meat. Don't you realize that animal agriculture is what's destroying the habitats of the animals that you're supposedly trying to preserve? And he went, he rolled his eyes and, you know. Yeah, but, they wouldn't burn coal in the foyer, would they? So why? <laughs> Seems bizarre. And particularly when so much of this is about social change and setting examples and leading. I listened to, you mentioned Bill Gates, but I listened to him on a, a recent conversation where on the one hand, yes, he's talking about we need to switch to synthetic meats as if we need to wait for those because haven't you heard of and they're here and haven't you heard of plants but also he he also quite cheerily said i i still eat meat myself maybe about 50 50. Yeah. and it's so one of the largest private landowners in the world all this farmland he could reforest his farmland well Just i agree and I'm, and I'm, i was talking to a group about let's reach out to the bill and melinda gates foundation and say hey you want to stop climate change you want to reverse climate <laughs> change reforest all your farm yeah. and it's partly i'm not 
I don't think it's used, that useful to police what Bill Gates does in his personal life, but it's more about the example you're setting. Because if in part of the conversation, you're talking to the public and saying, I am ringing the alarm bell, don't you realize how serious this is? We are on the brink here. Why aren't you ready to change? But then two minutes later, you say, and personally, I can't be bothered to change either. What? You, you can't lead if you're not willing to make the shifts yourself, as I guess. So. Well, I think we should applaud him for at least bringing it into the conversation. Oh, and he's done so much uh, at the same time. I mean, you know, he's obviously one of the world's most successful business leaders, so business people are going to listen to him yeah and i think he took baby steps into the wading into the shallow end of the pool because uh newscasters started attacking him because advertiser-based media basically is paid for by the meat dairy and pharmaceutical industry and when you talk about pharmaceuticals just talk about meat and dairy because we wouldn't need all those pills for the most part, if we were eating plant-based. So the uh, cholesterol lowering pills, the erectile dysfunction pills, the this pills, the that pills, you watch, I don't know what it's like in England, but if you watch TV here, the commercials are either fast food or pharmaceuticals for the most, there's an insurance commercial here or there, but they're one and the same. So you're not gonna get the advertiser-based media to say, yeah, we should switch. And so the fact that he's even discussing this however imperfectly he's doing more than other people who yeah. it's not look people who are i always say the best and the brightest was a sarcastic title look what they brought us the vietnam war the best and the brightest but the best and the brightest this isn't that complicated yeah we're yeah. 7.9 billion humans eating 80 billion animals every year they're eat they're eating most of the food and a couple of trillion fish. And in a way, this brings us on to the final section of the conversation, which is how do you think about the future? Because in the way, in a way, some people like to put these challenges with animal agriculture, for example, as like a really difficult problem. There's trade-offs of interest. There's a win-lose situation. When I, and I think you see this pretty much as a win-win-win, right? As long as we could have a just transition to help the, the industries and the communities and the families who are currently involved in these in industries find a, a different path. And that transition needs proper investment. And the paper you mentioned earlier on, I think, well, sounds fascinating because it's starting to set out some of the practicalities about how we make these changes happen. As long as we can make that transition help happen in a compassionate way, it's a win, right? It's a win for humans. It's a win for non-human animals. It's a win for wild animals. It's a win for the planet and the ecosystem as a whole. But look at the pandemic. The pandemic is a zoonotic illness that jumped from animals to humans. You can quibble about where it started. There's a very good argument to be made is that it started at a wet market where they have wild animals mixed with domestic animals, blood, guts, feces all over the place. And I'm not pointing at any country. We have 80 wet markets in New York City alone. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and wet protest all the time and the news media completely ignores it. And where do you think swine flu came from? It didn't come from bats and pangolins, right? right? It came from right. pigs, right? And a uh, mad cow disease. Yeah, absolutely. Cows. So, so, yeah. so the list just goes on and on. And I think I've joked to people before that even if you had no, if, even if you just cared about humans, you didn't, you had no interest in non-human animals at all, there would still be an overwhelming argument to go vegan. You know, even if you really sure. didn't care. Sure. But, 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 in, but, but, that's, but that's one of the weird things, right? Because we're still... On the one hand, it feels like, certainly in some countries, the zeitgeist is shifting. Veganism has become more socially acceptable. It's seen as a bit less weird than it used to be. The alternatives are being more, they're coming down in price. They're more available. They're more they're cheap it's and they're accessible. Global movement. There are 80 vegan restaurants in Mexico City. I agree. It's really shifting. It feels like things are shifting. But at the same time, the level of consumption of animal products and the level of amount of suffering and death, the graphs just keep going up. So what's your view about how we can get to that better world? Because there's at least two scores of thought and you've touched on them already. One is the sheer force of moral argument, right? You point someone in the eye and my first ever guest, actually, I don't know if Carol Raphael Davis is a specialist at this. Very she's very awesome, but she is, she's feisty and brutal and she will just put it straight down the line. And that works with some people like you. Shane and Jane contributor. She covered uh, the protests against bullfighting. Of in course. France. Uh, it was like a war zone. They were there was practically gunfire. Yeah, I mean, she's, it was a, she's a fierce 
Jane Unchained contributor. She is awesome. She is awesome. But I think the difficulty is that it doesn't seem like there are that many people that will be persuaded by the force of moral argument. So we need the alternatives and we need the social shifts as well. What's your view about how we can get to a more compassionate future and how likely is it? I think everybody needs to do whatever they can. I'm a news, I was a news reporter. I'm using my skills to create basically a news organization, a nonprofit news organization generating content. We go live all the time. If you're a lawyer, you can do pro bono work for an animal rights organization. If you're a violinist, you could perform at a uh, an event to raise money. Anything you know how to do, you can use it to help animals. And we all need to get active. Every single vegan needs to get active. But I will say that I do see things changing because our global culture values money. And one of the big things I noticed was because people have laughed in my face. People have, of course, treated me as a freak because of this, especially in earlier times. But once the Beyond Meat stock was so successful, the IPO, the initial public offering, mm. all of a sudden, a lot of people who wouldn't give this issue the time of day started sniffing around and going, hey, that Beyond Meat stock, huh? And it was almost like they were more willing to eat the Beyond Meat itself because the stock was doing well. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was very odd, but whatever. We'll take it. We'll However, take it as a win. Yeah. And now you have all these companies jumping who are just so successful, Impossible Foods and Just Eat Just, which has the Just Egg. And you've got even... McDonald's, which had been resistant, I would say it's fair to say, coming out with the McPlant and you have yeah, Burger yeah. King and all this. So I think that cultural shift is happening now. I think even the big meat companies are aware that it's unsustainable. That's why some of the big meat companies are investing in these meat alternatives. One of them even created an entire vegan line. And when change occurs, it can change very rapidly. I'm yeah, no yeah. expert, but just look at the electric vehicle. Okay, there was a documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car back in the 90s. We could all be driving electric cars for decades. Now, the electric car that was created by American motive, automotive a giant, they decided, eh, we don't want to do it. We don't want to, it's too much trouble. They took the cars back and they killed the electric car. It's a great documentary. Some uh, people I know, interestingly enough, vegans were actually those who fought to keep their electric cars. So it later, that executive said it was the worst decision he ever made. And it, it was. It literally For many wars reasons, occurred yeah. because yeah. of that. And we're in the same situation. We were slogging along with veganism, blah, 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 and being the only one at a vegan restaurant and you know, all of that, the early stages. Now, I do believe Bill Gates is going to be the first of many who are going to realize the obvious. If it's too hot to support human life, is that good for business? It's not sustainable. It's got to go away. Personally, I would love to have it not be cultured meat, but anything that reduces suffering. Yeah. Now there's also sort of the vat meat, which is the brewer meat, which they basically reconstruct the cells. It doesn't involve any animals. That's where a lot of the money's going. I wish I had the correct term for that. But basically what they do is they match the, the molecular genetic structure. Yeah, they call it clean meat or cultured meat. Or No, cultured meat is where you actually use, sorry to me to snap at you there. But I just was uh, informed about this just yesterday. We were discussing it. Cultured meats, when you take like a biopsy from a cow and then you build, there's another uh, that's actually growing even faster than cultured meat where scientists replicate in a lab, the genetic molecular structure of whatever it's milk or whatever it is, synthetically. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they grow it. Yeah, with so it's synthetic very, biology rather than Yes, exactly. Brewing, yeah. And that's actually growing faster, according to some, than the culture meat. But so there's those. There's obviously the meat alternatives that have been so good, the cheese alternatives. Yeah. So... I do believe we're getting there. And I think yeah. that the unfortunate part is governments have been co-opted by the industries that are very short-sighted. They are the, they are the who killed the electric car people of our time. 
And for example, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture is pretty much run by, they just put in somebody who was, a, who was the agriculture secretary during the Obama era, and he's a, a, tra a dairy trade leader. Yeah. So of course he's going to put his thumb on the scale for dairy. So this is the problem. Governments are there. They've been co-opted by industries that are not thinking long term. And this is why it's so powerful that Kamala Harris has now said the vice president of the United States, she's dabbling in veganism, thanks to Cory Booker. And we were involved in a coalition of women who asked her to go vegan for the first of the year. Yep. And I don't know if she saw that, but she's been dabbling in veganism. She says she's vegan before six. So I'm hoping that she and the Cory Bookers of the world can get to the president's ear and explain to the president that the guy you got running the USDA, yeah. he's there, he's there. But the point is, let's stop subsidizing big agriculture that's destroying the climate. Let's subsidize people who are making fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, and legumes yeah. for human use, consumption. Use that money for a just transition away from the harmful industries. And, and, and there's, a, there's another challenge, because I agree, it feels like something's shifting. Things can happen quickly. Any social change feels painfully slow when you're in it. But you look back historically and on many different topics, things can change pretty quickly in historical terms. There is a challenge about some of the fast developing, very large economies. So if you look at India and China, and at the moment, that there's a danger that they follow in our awful path. But I think there's also some hope that they actually leapfrog us using some of the new technologies and also tapping into some of their ancient cultures that had more respect for uh, non-humans and they actually bypass the, the sort of... World. Yeah. So, they're, they're the experts in meat alternative. Yeah, absolutely. You look at Satan, you look at that. Yeah. And uh, so I think there's a real, there's actually a good chance that some of those fast developing countries and economies might actually sidestep the awful path we've followed, both on fossil fuels and on animal agriculture, and get more quickly to a better place than, than some of the Western economies. So yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I might as well be hopeful because as Ingrid Newkirk of PETA says, being sad doesn't help the animals. Yeah. And get back to, I guess, what we started at the beginning was, what's this all about? Who knows why we're here? Is it a big game and a test? And afterwards, you go through a dark tunnel and everybody says, oh, yeah, hey, great game. But we don't know. And I think the only thing we can do is do the best we can and just think of every possible way that we can try to move this needle forward toward a plant-based world. And, uh, and we're powerless over the rest. That's what is obviously a little frustrating is that we can do everything that we can do every day. We try to do as much as we can, and then we're powerless. I would just say, everybody, please support organizations like PETA, Mercy for Animals, that are doing incredible work. And I, I pick out PETA because PETA is so effective that they actually create phony, phony groups to attack PETA. And if you look and you investigate, those groups are funded by the industries that PETA is having an effective, that PETA is challenging. It's an incredible organization. I've worked with them since the very founding it was when I was just becoming an animal rights activist as they were growing and I've seen them. And it's just an absolutely incredible organization. I can attest to that. And Mercy for Animals is great. There's And support your sanctuaries. There's little ways. Also support the veganomy. If you can, hire a vegan handyman. I have a vegan handyman. I have a vegan hairdresser. Haven't seen them in a while because of COVID, but they'll be back. Give your money to people who aren't going to use it to buy animal products. It's impossible, obviously, all the time. But keep that in mind, too. Yeah, it's a hopeful message. Bef before we wrap up, if you've got a few more minutes, there was one final question I was going to ask you about the future, sure. because I share that sort of hesitant but optimistic view that things are sh feel like they're shifting rapidly and we might be able to make some really radical changes pretty quickly. And whatever we might think about the religion or the supernatural or the meaning of life, hopefully we can all agree that suffering is a bad thing and we should try and cause less of it. So uh, <laughs> it seems like a no-brainer. But for people who challenge the non-human animal movements and say, look, we've got enough problems within the human species with caste and race and discrimination and, and so on. Shouldn't we focus there first? What, how do you respond to that challenge? Because my personal view is I think there's a positive synergy be 
between all of these things. The animal agriculture, let's just talk about women and feminism, okay, as a woman. The animal agriculture industry is based on rape, sexual violation. None of these animals in these factory farms are making love. They are all sexually violated, the males and the females. Yeah. And so if you're a feminist, why support something that is the epitome of violating sacred femininity? They literally have a term in the industry called rape rack. Yeah, that's what it's called, right? Put the, put the cows. So as a feminist, how can you support that? As a, a woman who's a woman of color, I'm a Puerto Rican, along with being Irish, and I have a little German and Spanish in there too. I'm a, a whole mix of a lot of things. Yeah. But yeah. they don't have any slaughterhouses on Park Avenue or Beverly Hills or around Hyde Park. Yeah. Okay. Th they have the poorest people, the most persecuted people who have no choice go in there and kill for eight hours a day after day. So you can run around in your yoga outfit talking about how peaceful you are. Yeah. And I'm okay, with you, right? So not only that, but they target communities of color. In fact, good news, the African-American community in the United States is reportedly the fastest growing demographic switching to veganism. Yeah. As people wake up and they realize, wow, there's a great documentary coming up by John Lewis, the badass vegan called They're Trying to Kill Us. That this food, defending your right to eat a burger and a shake, is not it's self-sabotage. And if any one of those groups, if women took their money away from fast food, if the communities of color took their money away from fast food, which is really how a good percentage of people eat their animals, yeah. okay, it would collapse the system. If people started feeding their dogs vegan food, it would collapse the system. There are very little threads holding the animal agriculture system together. Dairy, the, in the plant-based movement, dairy is the most successful. And it's skyrocketing. I'm sure in London, I was in Berlin several years ago, uh, about three years ago, and everywhere I turned, it was just Oatly, 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 giant, the size of buildings, Oatly. And now they're coming to America. They had a commercial on the Super Bowl. Dairy is the fastest growing in the plant-based space. Yep. People are switching to dairy and they're, they're freaking out. And again, the government is propping up the dairy industry. I'm sure it's the same in Europe. They're trying to pass laws saying you can't, I think you can't call Very it milk, so. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's actually the government is in cahoots with the meat and dairy industry. Yeah, they're a break Even on change. Even as they talk about we have to address climate change, it's smoke and mirrors. And unfortunately, I don't see that. That's where I, I think with the, the government is the most, I'd say the thorniest issue, these governments around the world. Yeah, and yeah. And that's why you have great organizations like Extinction Rebellion that are coming up and saying, and the Greta Thunbergs of the world. Yeah, pushing back. I, I agree with you. I think a lot of these non-human animal and these human ethics issues intersect and they link up in ways that we can, you know, resolve all of them at once. And I think one of the other central lessons of, you know, my amateur. Oh, by the way, climate yeah. change is going to kill everybody. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't discriminate. It does discriminate because unfortunately, people in yeah. um, certain areas are going to suffer more severely. In fact, our immigration crisis is largely due to animal agriculture because the people who are moving from Latin America up north for generations were subsistence farmers on their land, growing food and eating off their land. And because of climate change, that land is no longer temperate enough to support them. It goes from extreme wind to extreme rain to they, they can't grow crops. So they're all moving to, to because they can't live on their land anymore. In Texas, I'm involved with a sanctuary in Texas. They've had hundred year floods every couple of years. They had yeah. to move their sanctuary they They call themselves climate change refugees. So ever, even the immigration crisis is a result of animal agriculture. But ultimately, if we destroy our planet, it's going to kill everybody. Okay. <laughs> People would like to think humans can't go extinct, right? Not humans. Sure they can. If the, if the planet becomes too hot to support life, we're finished. And, and I'd That's say why that I get back to my countdown to year zero. Dr. Silas Rao makes a very powerful argument in my documentary. 2026. It's a powerful call to arms.
And I think if anything, there's, that's one of the central messages of human history is that we've, we're working out slowly, originally from kin and tribes, larger groups, then humanity, and then all of sentient life and the planet, that ultimately helping others helps you too. And by extending our moral compassion and consideration more broadly, it helps the people who are doing the extending. It always does. And I think the same is true as you cross the species boundary. Yeah, we just need to keep going and fast. Maybe climate change will bring us all together it and we'll be. realize yeah. that we're all earthlings and that we need to protect our earth and that we could stop fighting amongst ourselves. Personally, I believe when we evolve to the point where we can't kill animals, war will go away, all the racial divisions, all of that will go away because we will have evolved as a species beyond that. Yeah. So yeah. it is the ultimate litmus test. And I hope we pass the test. I hope that we survive. And we're really getting to a critical turning point, according to the scientists. We're approaching the point of no return. I just, I really do hope that in the next, really the next decade could be, the next six years could be the most important years in the history of humankind. Imagine that. Yeah. The imperative is clear. Jane, that has been a fascinating, inspiring whirlwind of a conversation. Thank you so much. And yeah, you, in this conversation, you're doing another little part to normalize compassionate, rational thinking, which is my overall plan. So hopefully uh, we'll meet that challenge you've laid out. And before we wrap up, what's the best way of people following you, learning about your work? You've mentioned so many of your different contributions, but where's the main place you'd point people at? JaneUnchained.com. And I will include the links. .com, thousands of vegan recipes, all sorts of information. So please visit it, subscribe. I send an email out twice a week with all the latest recipes and also big stories in the news in the vegan world. That's brilliant. Thank you. I would encourage everyone to go and follow. It's an amazing range of content. And we also need to look at the paper you mentioned about the vegan world by 2026 and the, and the documentary you mentioned too. So. Yeah, Countdown to Year Zero. I believe it's available in England on Amazon's Prime Video. That's brilliant. Well, thank you, Jane, so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. It was fun, fun chat. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.